comfortable with that risk that exists with raw milk. But I do want to say that we're not talking about consuming milk that comes from a commercial dairy. I would never drink milk, raw milk from a commercial dairy because there are so many pathogens. They feed them antibiotics. They get antibiotic resistant strains. We find all the time contamination. That's why it needs to be pasteurized. But with raw milk, anybody that produces it tests their milk regularly and feels really the quality and the health of their cows and the milk is really essential. So usually it's a, it's a I was going to say it's a completely different animal. It's, it's, it's apples and oranges, really. But I just want to throw all of that out there. So why, why might you want to consider raw dairy? Well, there is a diet called the Specific Carbohydrate Diet, and they do do some dairy. And so some people choose to do raw milk yogurt. They make their own uh, yogurt from raw milk as opposed to pasteurized milk. That's one, one, one opportunity for this. Raw butter as well. There's a diet by, doc, by, by Donna Gates. She, is, uh, she has a, a book called The Body Ecology Diet that's about yeast overgrowth. And she applies this diet to autism, and she really uses a lot of raw butter. This raw butter contains butyric acid, which is really healing for the lining of the intestinal tract, which is so important, and has antimicrobial properties, and also helps to nourish the brain and that sort of thing. So butyric acid is, is present in all butter, but in higher concentrations in raw milk. And phosphatase, this is one of my favorite things about raw milk. Phosphatase is an enzyme. And to consider something pasteurized, the, this is a very difficult enzyme to destroy. So to pasteurize it, they, they look at the measurement of zero phosphatase. And if there's no phosphatase, they know it's fully pasteurized. Well, phosphatase, it's an enzyme whose main function is calcium absorption. So if you drink you can drink milk all day long, pasteurized milk, and if you don't have any of the enzyme that assists with the calcium absorption, it's not really surprising that we're having so much problem with osteoporosis, even though some of those people are consuming milk and cheese so much. So just a really interesting thing that most people don't realize. There are other wonderful enzymes for digestion so that people that are lactose intolerant can often handle raw milk. There are natural probiotics in the milk. And there was a study that's uh, in my book on farm milk that talks about these people drinking milk straight from their farm, reducing the rate, rates of asthma. So some really interesting research. So all I want to do is just open up your mind to the possibility of that. I believe that through cow shares, you can have access to raw milk if that was something you were interested in. So I'll leave that up to you to do some further research and see if something that would be appropriate or not for your family. And realmilk.com has some more information on it as well as some sources for you. So protein. Protein are the building blocks that help, that, that build everything, build the tissues, enzymes, uh, substances necessary for detoxification, immune system. They help with, they're, they're the building blocks for neurotransmitters. So we need to get protein. And so we need to figure out, one, I guess one of the things is that a lot of times children with autism often don't really like protein. They typically carbs, carbs, carbs. And it's really kind of a struggle to get protein in. But you, you really want to work on doing your best to get some protein in them because it's so essential for their growth. And the amounts, again, are going to vary. Like with everything for children that are, tend to be sensitive, you have to figure out a little bit about what that amount is for your particular child. Some children that can't process protein well, children with high ammonia levels, low hydrochloric acid, low zinc, low B6 or low iron. And these are some things that if you work with certain, there's, there are physicians out there that are skilled in something that we call bio, the biomedical approach, which looks at functional testing, ways of testing what these levels of these substances are in the system. So you can make some more educated decisions on how to proceed. Signs of protein deficiency, stunted growth, loss of hair, immune system deficiencies, things like that. Let's talk a little bit about soy. Often when people do a gluten and casein free diet, they go to a lot of soy, soy milk, soy yogurt, soy everything. And soy is not a great substitute for dairy. It's also not a great protein in general for vegetarians and and, and anybody Ver for several reasons. One is because it's very inflammatory to the gut. There are lectins, oxalates, phytates 
in soy and they create a lot of gut inflammation. And as we talked about at the very beginning, children on the autism spectrum often have a lot of gut inflammation. And so this substance usually is problematic. It also appears that it may be creating an opiate response similar to the gluten and casein. So while, again, I just met somebody yesterday who did gluten and casein but substituted a lot of soy, found some problems with that, took out the soy, and things started to open back up again like they saw when they originally went on the GFCF diet. So, Keep, be aware of that. And the other thing about these phytates and these substances is they bind to calcium, magnesium, zinc, iron, and we need all of the good minerals that we can get. And if we're binding them up to bind to those phytates, we're, we're missing some of those good nutrients that we would otherwise be getting. It also inhibits thyroid function, something that often is also low in children on the spectrum. And so just something to be aware of. It also has a lot of estrogens, and these, we just don't know the long-term effects of children who don't have their hormonal system really balanced and developed yet, how all of these estrogens are affecting boys and girls. It's, it, it, we're seeing some research and some information showing that it's not particularly good. So we want to, I, my, my personal uh, when I, opinion when I implement a gluten and casein-free diet, I pretty much always recommend taking soy out as well. So what, is that? what do we do if we're a vegetarian then? Well, if you can eat eggs, then eggs are a source of protein and I would recommend that. But when, you, sometimes eggs and dairy are not tolerated and so you get a little limited. Also sometimes nuts are not tolerated, so you lose another protein source. Sometimes they won't eat beans. So you can see that very quickly all of these vegetarian protein sources get diminished to some extent and sometimes significantly. And we don't want to feed too many grains because they can be inflammatory as well as feeding yeast overgrowth. And we can't live on fat alone. So I, I, I always have people in the audience as well as clients of mine that for whatever personal reasons choose not to eat meat and, and that's fine. My husband's a vegetarian. I'm very respectful of that personal decision. You may want to consider though if your child is becoming more and more, as sometimes with autism diets we have to restrict things and so if, if it starts to getting too restrictive you may want to consider whether you want to expand the diet into some animal proteins. I think for certain individual individuals, a vegetarian diets can be very healthy. But if you're sick or you're not doing well, you may need to make a different choice than you otherwise would. So just keep that in mind. Carbohydrates. We want to get carbohydrates and we want to get as many good quality complex carbohydrates as possible. Sweet potatoes, whole grains, vegetables, fruits. We want to reduce the refined carbohydrates, the flour products, the cookies, the pasta the breads. We want to avoid or reduce sugar as much as possible too. This is something kids love sugar and kids on the autism spectrum often eat a lot of sugar. And so we really, it's important because of the potential for yeast overgrowth as well as just it, it's very deficient in nutrients. We have to use our good nutrients. So keeping sugars as low as possible. I put a few guidelines up here in terms of trying to keep the serving size low, trying to stick with fruits and those types of things. Keep the fruit juices lower. Keep the candy and the refined sugars, the cane sugars, at low as low as you can. And just be aware that your child may be craving sugar. So it may take you some time to wean them off sugar. but. I would, I would have some resolve and I would have some determination that you are, that is your goal. That, you know, if, if we leave it up to them, we're never going to get the sugar out of the diet. So sometimes we have to be a little firm and say, we're reducing the sugar. And I know this isn't going to be easy, but little by little over the course of a couple of weeks or whatever it is, let's take that sugar out. And then some people, in turn, when we're talking about carbohydrates, some people do eliminate larger categories of starches and that's a diet called the specific carbohydrate diet that we'll get into a little bit but for most people that's that's not